This mess of the True Crime Podcast. I'm Kara here with Stu. Say hey, Stu. Hey. All right. So we are back with you again. And on this episode, we are going to the lovely state of Alabama, Stu. Alabama. All right. So before we get into the podcast, just for anybody who is new, we do banter, we cuss, we talk about murder. And yeah, so just get you a he- give you a heads up that those that's what's going on. And then for all you that are have been around for a while. We wanted to let you know that we started up our Patreon. You can check that out in the show notes. And we'd also appreciate if you guys would um, leave us a review on iTunes. Um, subscribe to the podcast. That helps. Tell your friends. So we really appreciate it. And I think that's it. Stu, do you have anything else to add before we get into the episode? I have nothing to add at this time. Okay. <laughs> all right. Now that we got all that business out of the way let's start talking about some shit that went down down in alabama just a typical day of the week there though right am i, I right Stu? just like a tuesday in alabama <laughs> yep michael earl reese was born july 5th 1974 to earl and sandra reese michael was described as a rock in the community he was well liked growing up he had he was the kind of guy that had um friends from middle school all the way up till he was an adult he was well liked. He was very smart. He even went into IT, and he was described as funny and kind. Now, Michael, he would marry, but this would ultimately end in divorce. This devastated Michael because he was a very religious guy, and you know, in the religious community, divorces, you know, can be frowned upon. Somewhat, and feel, yeah. yeah, and can feel like you know earth shattering that you couldn't make it work for whatever reasons. I'm not sure why his they didn't really go into detail. Right about why his first marriage didn't work, but for him it was a very devastating situation to have that, um, what, he, what he saw as a failure. Michael met Cindy Henderson in 2008. They were set up on a blind date, pretty much, and then they hit it off right away. Kind of like me and Kara, I guess. Oh. No? <laughs> no. Cindy was coming from a broken place in her life. Cindy's her- first husband had committed suicide. And this sent Cindy into a very dark place of depression, as one might imagine. Her friends and family were excited when she started dating Michael. He seemed to be a good Christian guy, and their relationship escalated pretty quickly. The couple was married in 2009 after dating for just one year. This lifted Cindy up, and she was happy and light again. Yes, her family and friends described her as light, like a... Like a, a lightness that she hadn't had in you know since her her first husband had killed himself. Yeah, that she was basically described as just storm clouds following her wherever she went, just yeah. in a dour mood all the time. And yeah, which is understandable. One yes, one might see that. Cindy was a member of the Sardis Baptist Church in Gardendale, Alabama, which is just one town over from Morris, Alabama, where the couple would live. Cindy was very involved with her church, and she was the music minister, which meant she was in charge of the music department for the church. Yeah, we need to clarify that, because not everybody grew up in the church like I did, Stuart. They didn't, may not know what a music minister is. I have no idea what a music you minister is. You didn't know what one was? No. Well, that's why I explained it, because I was thinking some of these heathens will be out there listening, <laughs> and they need it explained to them. The only time I went to church with my Grammy, she was Southern Baptist. Oh, well, they certainly had a music minister, I can tell you that. I'm sure they did. I just didn't they know all the, the ins and outs They had it. the church elders. They had it all. So anyway, you can tell us what a music minister is? A music, it's just a person that's in charge of, it's the head of the, it's the minister of music, kind of like the minister of magic in uh, Harry Potter, but over the music. And the church would not appreciate that I made that uh, comparison? comparison at all. <laughs> well, since this is a Baptist church, if it's a Southern, probably in Alabama. I'm sure there weren't like that church you went to with all that guitars and heathen shit going oh, on. Oh, yeah, we had guitars and everything. You could even clap. What? Yes. 
I ain't clapping at no damn Baptist church. No, I, my friends were Baptists. There was straight up hymnals. and Anyways, we've gone way down, <laughs> way down the line. But if you've ever been to the church growing up, you you understand what we're talking about. So anyways. Yeah. So she's in the head charge of the music department at church. So she's a head at of the At a Baptist choir. church. At a, yeah. at a serious church. Yeah. Kara went to the hippie church where they played guitars and clapped and sang. And okay. All kinds All of right. weird All right, moving shit. on, moving on. So Michael happily obliged his new wife, and he started attending this church as well, even though he grew up as Methodist. I'm guessing he didn't know what he was getting into. No. The couple did not have any children, but both had professional careers. Cindy worked for the county as an accountant, and Michael worked in IT at the Birmingham Hospital, which was just 20 miles from where the couple lived in Morris, Alabama. Fun fact, I mean, he probably... Went to Talladega every year as well because Talladega is right there near. I doubt he went. Birmingham. No, I doubt he went there. But why not? Way. No. You don't think he liked no. going races? No. Why not? I just don't think, Stuart. That's where I began and ended my NASCAR career. Okay, I know you drove it one time. Okay, you paid. Know. You paid. Someone paid for you to drive it. All right. My sponsor. Most people don't even know what Talladega is. All right. So yep. So they're working. And living in Morris, Alabama. Well, working in Birmingham and living in Morris, Alabama. On February 18, 2015, it was a typical Wednesday for the Reeses. Michael and Cindy, they got up. They headed off to work that morning. They actually rode together to work. So Michael dropped Cindy off first at the courthouse, where, and then he was headed off to his job. Now, after work, he picked up Cindy. They stopped by Cindy's mother's home to assist with the trash. They would help her gather it and bring it to the curb every Wednesday because they're, you know, nice guy. He's going to help out. They're going to help out her mom. Well, that's what you do. Yeah? Do you go take your mom's trash out to the curb? No. (laughs) Okay. It's too far across town. It's too far across town. (laughs) Wow. Anyway, so that night, it's Wednesday night, and so if you grew up in the church, you know there's a service every Wednesday night. you got to get your Jesus in midway through the week. So they attended a nighttime service at church from 6 to 7 p.m., that was youth group night in my at my church too. That was youth group night. Anyways, good good memories there. Now afterwards, they went to a restaurant called I want to pronounce it Milo's, but it's actually Milo's Hamburgers, which apparently is a local favorite that's been around for decades, opening in 1946. Now I heard so much and read so much about Milo's, and people went on and on the reviews, everything. Everybody loves the place. So if you live in Alabama, please. Go eat some of these french fries for us because <laughs> apparently they're famous. They're world famous. Well, if they live in Alabama, they probably already are eating them. Yeah, I mean, I'm jealous. I honestly, right I'm ready to go on a road trip and we got to go stop at this Milo's Hamburgers. Now, after they made it home with their food, Cindy, she remembered she needed some items from the store. So she left home and went to the Piggly Wiggly in town. Yes, Piggly Wiggly is a thing. If you're listening to this from up north... Piggly Wiggly and how they make jokes about the Piggly Wiggly. It's a true thing down here in the yes, South. Yes, we have them here. Yeah. I have them there. Yeah, They're I've been to a down. Piggly Wiggly. We have shopped at Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> yep. So Cindy walks into the home and she sees the place in disarray. She or she gets back from the store, so she walks back into the house. She sees the place in disarray. Tables overturned. She calls out for Michael and doesn't get a response, so she calls 911. The 911 operator did receive a call from Cindy, and Cindy's saying that she can't find her husband. She tells the operator that a table has been flipped over and that she can't find him. She is afraid there is an intruder in the house still, potentially, so she's waiting on police to arrive. Yeah, she's, she's saying she's not, going, she's not going anywhere past the... She's gone in the front door, sees the table knocked over, and she's not going any further. She just calls out for him. And she's telling him, I can't find him, I can't find my husband, and everything like that looks like someone's in the house. She's yeah. afraid to go any further. So she decides she's going to wait on a place before she goes to look any further in the house. Now, the police do arrive on the scene pretty quickly, as the station is across the street from the home that's located on Bank Street in Morris, Alabama. As soon as they enter the home, they see what Cindy saw, but just beyond that, down the hallway in the dark, they see a man lying, not moving and he's there on the ground in the in the back hall. The man was quickly identified as Michael Reese, and it was clear that he was dead. Since it was a small town, the police department calls in for backup to process the crime scene. Jer- Jefferson County Sheriff's Department arrives to assist them in processing this crime scene. 
They're like, we ain't never had anybody murdered before. We better call somebody that's seen some shit. Yeah, it's been a hot minute since anybody around here been murdered. Yeah. So it was apparent to everyone there that this was not an accident, that Michael was clearly murdered. When looking closer, they found that Michael had been shot in the back of the head. The Reese's were adding on to their home, and Michael was found in the, the unfinished part of the house in the back there. Yeah, so when police are entering, looking straight from the front door, it's down a hallway, like Stu said, down to that back hallway, and then there's an unfinished room back there, and they can clearly see him from that vantage point. Uh, Yeah, and according to the police, it looked like the house had been broken into, and the table was overturned, as she described it. So it did look like a home robbery turned into a murder. There was even some jewelry missing. However, upon inspection, they couldn't find any forced entry. Yeah, so there's there's things not adding up right off the bat. There's what looks like a home robbery but then and a murder, but then somebody didn't have to actually break in to get there. So was the door left unlocked whenever Cindy left to go to the store or something else, folks? <laughs> was it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Police, they start questioning Cindy to see what her story was for the day. She gives them the whole rundown. Things checked out as there was. So the whole thing about how, you know, they went to work. Like we already went through their whole story. For the day, went to work, came home, went to Milo's, blah, 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 blah. She gives the rundown to police. And like I said, things were checking out. There was a Piggly Wiggly grocery bag found in the home with some ham in the form of lunch meat. Not like an Easter ham, but ham lunch meat. And some orange juice. Cindy is upset in her interview. She's holding back tears, but she is able to answer police questions. They ask her if anyone would want to hurt Michael or if anyone would have access to the home, to enter with the key, someone might want to take something from them. She mentions the contractor and that they had construction crews, and the contractor did have access to the house. He had a key to go in and out, but she didn't believe that he would want to harm Michael or would want to try to break in or anything, but that's, that's the only other person that she can name that would be able to have access to the home without breaking in the door. They interviewed Cindy for uh, several hours, but during this time, what they really wanted to address were some rumors that him going around town, and Cindy's not bringing him up, but the officer's like, hey, I need to, he's trying to be a polite gentleman instead of, <laughs> you know, nice southern gentleman with his lady, and he's like, hey, we need to talk about these rumors. There had been talks of Cindy cheating on Michael. No. No. There had also been a complaint about Cindy having sex with a man in a Cook's Pest Control vehicle in the parking garage at the courthouse where she worked. This is salacious, dude. In the Cook's... Can we be classier than the Pest Control vehicle? I guess we cannot. (laughs) Maybe she had crabs. This is... (laughs) Oh, disgusting. The rumors made it around this small town. Even the church elders were talking about it because the man Them that she... Them gossipy bitches. <laughs> mm-hmm. The person she was supposedly having done the deed with was Pastor Jeff Brown, who was the pastor of their small church. The pastor or the pastor, Stu? Well, Louie. I don't know. Was he Louie or was he Jeff? Oh, he was Jeff. He was the pastor. <laughs> Jeff had become the pastor of the church. See, I, I can... No, that's a reference to... Tamara Judge, who would call, you don't know anything about this, but no. the Royal House was in Orange County. She was like super, she got like super into Christianity. And the whole time she would say pastor instead of pastor <laughs> when she was talking <laughs> about her, her pastor. And it was just really funny. But anyways. I won't say the word Roy. No. Okay, let's go. Jeff had become the pastor of the church in 2014. The parishioners thought he would be a great fit since he was a younger fella and would hopefully bring in a younger crowd into the church and start building up the attendance. Because that's how that works. Yes, you got to have attendance up. You got to get them younger people coming in, Stu, because you can't have just old people going because they're going to die out and your church is going to die out. So you got to get some young blood in there bringing in some... Yeah, that's usually how it works. Some tithing each month. Every church has got to get a new pastor, priest... Father, whatever you want. I know to go that, with. but I'm saying bringing in the younger people. They got to keep their church alive. Well, yeah, you got to keep you got to keep that attendance rolling over with the and you need with them the young. Newer, newer generation, right? And then the young people are on a fixed income, so their their tithing will be will increase as they get older. 
Exactly. The el- older people, they're on a fixed income. They're like, well, I can only give you so much, guys. <laughs> 10% of Social Security is 10% of Social yep. Security. That's, That's it. That's it. Now, the rumors did end up getting all the way back to Cindy that people had seen her out there doing the... Th- throwing doing her, the nasty? Yeah, throwing her freak flag up according to the rumors going Which on. Which has got to be embarrassing when the rumors come back to you that people have been talking about this. When you thought nobody saw you, if she did, if the rumors well, allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. Now she told her Cindy. She told her cousin about the rumor, and completely denied it to her cousin. Of course. Her cousin told people that it would be physically impossible for this to be true, since both Cindy and Jeff were ample. We're going to use that word ample. <laughs> ample. They were. They were fluffy. Listen, I'm not a slender woman or whatever, but whatever you see pictures, whenever you saw pictures of the truck that they supposedly were doing it in and pictures of the two, I mean, these are not, when we say ample, we're talking probably they're getting 300 dog. pounds yeah. maybe. Like, they're, it's, it's a larger, which is fine. That's fine. But we're just saying it's, there's some physicality issues going on about just, you know, Getting them Science. on in a compact truck. Physics. It's not gonna happen. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. And her cousin was her cousin's the one that brought this up because she was like, uh, "Guys, this doesn't even sound right." Because I don't know how this even would work. Yeah, I don't, don't want to imagine works. it either personally. But <laughs> as one can imagine, this was a very awkward conversation to have, and it also pretty much embarrassing for everyone involved, including Michael, who began to hear the rumors about Cindy cheating on him. And now I just want to say it also couldn't couldn't have been because of the same reasons. It couldn't have been Michael and Cindy because Michael was similar. a larger man, similar yes. in size to Pastor Jeff as well. So, yeah, we, we I mean, we're, we're only mentioning it because the cousin said it. If the cousin said it, I was thinking it, but the cousin said it. <laughs> yeah, you got two, 250 at least, possibly 300 pound plus people trying to like... In a Chevy Just S- stop, okay. Chevy S- Okay, we get it, we get it, we get it. A Toyota it, Tacoma. It. Yeah, so anyway, so, so Michael, he believes Cindy, and they continue to work on their marriage, which had become rock, rocky as of late. Cindy continues to talk to police, and she tells them that Michael and her had begun to have problems in 2013. Michael seemed withdrawn from their relationship. They stopped being intimate, and Michael was retreating like any IT guy would do. He would go to his computer and play games it review one star <laughs> yeah anybody's an it is like this is bullshit as they play their video games <laughs> one star. computer games anyway so he's retreating into his computer into his games and stuff like that cindy felt lonely and as she's talking to michael he actually at one point or this is from her what she's saying he said it was probably time for her to leave so I don't know if this is something i mean michael had been divorced before i don't know if this is similar issues maybe he gets he gets a certain way where he withdraws from a relationship or something. I don't know. But um, this was before she actually met Pastor Jeff. So this is issues going on. And she's saying this is what led me into the, Pastor the path. Pastor Jeff's and, arms. Yes. And other things. Oh, wait. Has she admitted to adultery yet? <laughs> no, at no, this no, point? no. Oh. Well, never mind. As you can imagine, she just didn't feel loved anymore. And like we said, this is where she turned to Pastor Jeff, and she went in for advice and to express her concerns about her marriage. Now, this is this is a common thing in the church. People turn to their pastors for these like counseling and to pray with them and get everything. So, her going to the pastor isn't a crazy situation. Now, Pastor Jeff, he was a shoulder for Cindy to lean on, and the chats about her marriage quickly turned to other topics. They became good friends, and the Reese's would even babysit Jeff's children because Jeff was married at the time with two children. After a while, Cindy admits that they fell in love with each other. She denies the rumors about them having sex in the pest control vehicle, but the damage had already been done at that point. She ended up leaving the church and resigning as music minister in the spring of 2014, just, you know, shortly after starting to to, uh, be with Jeff. And this was when she says the affair actually became physical. It seemed the affair was strange. Cindy admits to having sex with Jeff until the fall of 2014, but then they just all of a sudden stopped. 
Police ask Cindy directly if she killed Michael, and of course she says no, and she begins to tear up, saying she couldn't even shoot a dying animal, and she couldn't have shoot her husband. There's just no possible way. She tells police that there was no reason for her to shoot Michael, as he was well aware of this affair, and because the guilt had begun to get to her, and she wanted to confess to him and try to work on their marriage. So she's a Christian woman, or so she says. I don't know if she's living the principles, but... <laughs> Doesn't seem to sound like it, however. But she is feeling guilty. She, you know, having this, this having sex with Pastor Jeff, decides to stop. She's like, oh, I'll go back to Michael. We're going to try to work it out. And he's kind of like, well, okay, we'll work it out, da-da-da-da-da. And that's where they are, and they decide to go on this big Disney World trip to try to rebuild this this thing. So what you're telling me is somebody hit the lottery. Oh, because Disney World's so expensive. Because tickets ain't cheap. No. Well, this is 2014. This is before Disney. This is for, before current Disney that's like, we're just going to charge $500 for two people for one day. <laughs> and ridiculous. your parking's $150 oh, or yeah. whatever the hell it was. We went to Disney World because I had... Anyway, long story. We had tickets from the pan, before the pandemic that we couldn't use because they closed down. So we needed to use them, but oh my God, Disney World is ridiculous. It's just, I can't, I, I was, I was very disappointed. Maybe I'm doing Disney wrong. I don't know, but. <laughs> Mickey Mouse, one star. Yeah, Mickey Mouse, one star. So they planned this big Disney World trip for their fifth anniversary in the fall of 2014. And they had a really good time on the trip. They wanted to continue to build on that momentum. However, Jeff, Pastor Jeff over there, he was constantly calling the entire trip while Cindy Act annoyed by it, she actually continued to talk to Jeff leading up to Michael's murder. So she's acting like, oh, he doesn't need to be texting me. It's I'm trying to rekindle my romance with my husband, yada, yada, yada. And you got these Mickey Mouse ears, we're got a turkey leg, trying to <laughs> pineapple whip, get our freak on <laughs> yes. later at the, at at the, the whatever. hotel. Yeah. So, anyways, they, uh, they're. <laughs> can't even with you Stuart. anyways what why, what i do why do you go in with your freak on at your hotel and everything like that it's just isn't that what you do at a hotel no not at disney don't bring a black light to the Dude. disney hotels Stuart, shut not do it. Up. you're an idiot anyways so she continues to talk to jeff even though she acts annoyed by it please bring old pastor jeff in for some questioning and he admits to the affair with cindy right off the bat He's telling the the popos, you got to hate the sin, not the sinner. Classic. Classic, Jeff. So police tell him that they are looking at him and Cindy as the only two people that had a motive to kill Michael. Jeff denies killing Michael, but tells detectives that he's in love with Cindy and wants to be with her. He had resigned from the church as pastor, but this was only because he was being brought in so they could fire his ass. Yeah, so he's... He was making changes to be with Cindy, and one was, well, he would have continued to be, let's be honest, would have continued on with the, the being the pastor of the church, but he tells Cindy, I'm resigning to be with you, but he, in all reality, he was going to be fired anyways. Yeah, so. So he's pre- preparing his life to be with Cindy. He also stated that the, he was in the process of just divorcing his wife. Police bring up the fact that Cindy was not progressing with divorcing Michael, and Jeff admits that this kind of bothers him and that he's concerned that Cindy had no intention of leaving Michael. So it sounds like they had a pact to divorce each divorce their respective spouses and then get together and get it on. And Jeff is going full steam ahead, but Cindy's like, eh, I'm going to Disney World, folks. Yeah. <laughs> World, I mean, we're not talking Disneyland. We're going to Disney World. Well, they are yeah. in Alabama. It's a lot closer. Yeah. It's a lot closer to go to Florida. However, they're going to the big one. He's, he's dropping the, the big money. Yeah, at the Disney World. Yeah. So Jeff is also upset that Cin- Cindy was still sleeping with Michael, who happens to be her husband. We're talking about sleeping in the biblical sense, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're, they're lying together, yes. attempting to procreate. Yes. They apparently had rekindled their romance from when it was at its lowest, and Jeff is saying that Cindy would describe what Michael and her would do, and it was, quote, just nasty. Which is just, one, it's weird that she's describing to her, the man she's having an affair with, her sex life with her husband, 
And two, what on earth does Cindy doing? That's just nasty to old. Uh, I wonder if it's the actual axe or just the fact that he he's upset that they're together. Yeah, he he's upset that it's I missionary just... style, or <laughs> they got some freaker okay, going on. All right, we get it, we get it. Okay, so basically, Jeff did not like the idea of Michael touching Cindy. Jeff was Michael question- didn't touching his own wife. Jeff yeah. didn't the whore. like that. Jesus. Oh my goodness. Jeff was questioned on his whereabouts, and he said he was about 50 miles away going to his storage unit. So they let Jeff go, and they went on to check out his alibi and learn a little bit more about the fellow's backstory. Meanwhile, police were able to rule out the contractor because he had an airtight alibi, and he had been at church, and there was multiple witnesses that said he was there. Everybody's at church. It's Wednesday. Literally everybody in that town is at church. Yeah. (laughs) So... The only All two people that weren't in church people. were Jeff and Cindy and Michael. <laughs> yeah. One was dead. The other two were trying to kill him. Yeah. No, Pastor Jeff, he had an interesting past, to say the least. He had held a variety of jobs, uh, ranging from a hairdresser all the way to a police officer. And as we know, currently a, or in the recent past, a pastor and then a pest control, a cook's pest control worker. So they found out that Jeff did have two children and actually one on the way. So this meant that he was sleeping with his wife and Cindy at the same time. So I don't know why he was so upset about Cindy continuing to sleep with Michael. He was obviously knocking up his wife uh, at uh-huh. the same time. So I don't know who's nasty. I think it might be old Jeff. And like we said, he did work at the Cook's Pest Control at the time. So that kind of substantiated those rumors about them having sex in the truck. Despite what the cousin said about the the actual physical possibilities that this could even happen. This well, is... maybe Jeff was, because of his size, got a full-size truck. No, he didn't. They, it was like a small, like, little, what are they, single cabs or whatever? Or they got the little little bucket seats or whatever in the back? I don't it might know. Might be a little extended, yeah. Anyway, so they began questioning friends and people around town about this Pastor Jeff. There were rumors that he had been watching the Reese home. He also followed them to the new church they started attending after they left the Sardis Baptist Church after all the rumors started and and Cindy had to quit as music minister. There was even people saying that he would even sit between them in the pews if they were already seated. So this again is another rumor by people at the church. Um, No one has like video or photos of this happening or whatever but it's pretty ballsy if he's going in and sitting between a married couple and i don't know why michael's just letting him just run all over him like this it's just i would think you'd get pissed off about the whole situation one would think that he would just smash his head with a brick or a bat or something okay that's why i got aggressive well i mean (laughs) why are you rolling up you don't know mow another man's grass there pastor jeff just don't do it oh god so Anyway, so as you can imagine, Jeff turned out to be quite the odd character and really was not very likable. He slept with many women at the same time, as we have seen, and he became obsessive over Cindy, and he basically just wanted her to himself. They began talking to co-workers of Jeff's, and they found out that just a month before, he had been asking around for someone to actually kill Michael. Now, the co-workers did report this to authorities, but it was in a different town, so investigators in Morristown or Morris, Alabama, weren't aware of this, like at the time of the murder, saying, oh, there's a report, we just had a report about someone, you know, trying to kill someone. So they found this out after they started talking around, asking people, and they were able to go talk to these, these, uh, the police in this other town. So with all of this, they began to doubt his alibi, and they brought Cindy back in for questioning while they subpoenaed all those cell phone records that are going to be so telling. If it, it, You can't hide from them cell phone records. You cannot. Well, nowadays you can do WhatsApp, but back then I don't think they were so keen on stuff like that. But the, still, the cell phone's going to ping off of something. So what's this WhatsApp? This <laughs> It's like a thing. You've seen it. We've used it. I've seen it. You can you can like get around and you can't. See I think it. they don't. I don't think they don't like track anything. Like or so they say that. Really? Yeah. Stewart. What? <laughs> don't get any ideals. Oh, okay. Police decide that they're going to bring Cindy back in for a little questioning because they want Cindy to walk walk them back through the events of the night. Make sure nothing's changed, you know. They got all these 
these this this a lot more details, if you will, Stu. Drink. That's how they get you. Yeah. Whenever you start changing the details of your story. Yes. Drink. <laughs> yes. Drink, drink, drink. <laughs> so, this time, Cindy decides that she's going to add in the fact that Jeff called her and she stopped at a gas station and gave Jeff $15 for gas. Well, that seems like a very important detail. Yeah, it does. One would think. Yes. Why would she be giving Jeff $15 for fuel anyway? What is old Jeff doing? He's well, not killing enough cockroaches or what? that could actually get you somewhere with gas, too, in current day. No, I'll get you about a gallon of gas yeah. these days. <laughs> they asked her again about not being able to find Michael. Now, when officers walked into the home, there he was. Yeah, there, was there was a clear, a clear shot, shot of Like Michael. we said, this, he, he's at the end of, you walk in the door... And as soon as they walked in, they saw him laying back there in that new construction area at the end of the hall. Like, it wasn't... I don't know why. They were saying, why would you say you can't see him? Yeah, it's, it's strange. She's making it sound like the criminal cut power to the house and all the lights were out and she just couldn't see it on the hall. Yeah, no. it was like a clear as day when they walked in like, hey, there's your dead husband back there. Yeah. He's Cindy. right there. Way to go, Cindy. So, police are not buying the shit that she didn't see him lying on on the floor back there. They also questioned her need to run the Piggly Wiggly after saying that she needed lunch meat and orange juice for the next morning because they searched the fridge. In the fridge, they found enough lunch meat and orange juice to easily get them through the next day. So her alibi, her story of why she had to go to the Piggly Wiggly, isn't making sense. Yes, and I looked up the hours of the Piggly Wiggly because that's who I am, Stuart. And, because I thought this as well, I thought, okay. Did you look say, it up for back in 2014, though? No, but I'm assuming they had similar hours. So, they close, so they get home from, they they leave church at 7. They stop at the Milo's, but they get it to go. So, say, this is a small town. They're 10 minutes away at their church, so then they get home. So, say they get home at the, the latest, 7.45, from getting this to go and, and, and heading to their house. The Piggly Wiggly closed at 9 p.m., Stuart. They're... There's no reason why you would just need to rush off to the Piggly Wiggly from, from you there. You need some orange juice and some lunch meat. Yeah. You need some orange juice and lunch <laughs> I'm lunchmeat. just saying she had some time, you know, to go to the Piggly Wiggly. You're saying she didn't have to leave that second. No, she didn't have to leave right when they got back home. She, she could have had time to, to be there a little bit. And they also just didn't need the lunch meat and the orange juice. Well, now, the next thing that detectives are queuing in on is pretty much why... They didn't think that Cindy was telling the truth to begin with. Was the real issue with this whole situation that I spotted that, that as most did Stu. And most of you are probably like, why did you gloss over that like 30 minutes ago and not say anything yeah, about it? This is a really, really big deal. Because we did gloss over it until we got to this point. Yes. You don't go to the fast food restaurant and get yourself a burger and fries. Go to your house. Set your shit down and go, oh, by the way, for the next 30, 45, one hour, I'm going to be at the grocery store. Yes, because what Stu didn't mention was that she specific, they specifically asked her, did you eat your food? And she said no, because in the crime scene photos, when they went in, the food, the bags of food were unopened with the burger and fries and the drinks just sitting on the table. Nobody had eaten. So they're saying they went, got the food to go, got home. Cindy's like, I got to go straight to the Piggly Wiggly, which didn't close till 9 p.m. Uh -huh. So you had plenty of time to eat your food. But she leaves her food and goes. You do not leave French fries, people. No. This is a smoking gun. Yeah. You don't leave warm fries to go grocery shopping. No. I mean, the fries barely make it from the... When you got them to your house, like you have to start eating those things in the car for them to be fresh. McDonald's, when, um, Wendy's, Chick Fil A, Waffle Fries, uh, even crappy ass Burger King fries. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> he said it. I said Burger it. King Bur does have the worst fries. <laughs> they do. They suck. And if you disagree with me, you can write to a very long email about yes, what, how he's wrong. Anyway, so that was that's what uh, detectives, as well as us being, um, you know, amateur detectives, first known as there's no way that you would leave. Amateur detectives <laughs> or French fry connoisseurs. <laughs> French fry. 
<laughs> French, French fry connoisseurs. Yeah, so, and apparently, supposedly, these Milo's French fries were, like, the best. And also, I'm sorry, but if I did, so say I needed to they go to They are the, crinkle cut. Yeah, so, and they apparently have some great seasoning, and he had worked on his... Probably some slap your mama His, like, Louisiana. special sauce or whatever for the burgers. He'd worked on it for months before he opened back in 1946. Anyways, I read the whole story about the whole opening of the restaurant. Anyways, the other thing is that, to me, if, say, I did have to go to the grocery store... I would take my fries with me. A burger, if you don't have like tomatoes or something that could make it soggy, like a Five Guys burger, it could make it through a 30-minute trip to the grocery store and then you come back. It's not going to be as good, but it could make it. But my fries, I can guarantee to you, I'm loading them up in the car and I'm eating them on the way to the Piggly Wiggly if I had to go. Yes. There's no way I'm leaving them. No. Because you can't reheat fries. We all know this. No, you cannot. It, it's never Microwave, oven. Nope. I've heard some people have luck with an air fryer. I've never tried it. But, Do that, though. But it's never the same. So, anyways, I know we've gone along, on a long time about the fries, but we and can all agree. And our next episode will be all about Milo's fries. <laughs> yes. We're actually going to travel there. We're going to get different fries. We're going to taste test them. We're going to let you guys know. But this is really like the smoking gun and thing. This just does not make sense to anyone that is looking at this crime scene in this case, that she would leave the food there and not eat it, or at least the fries. Or take the shit with her to the grocery store yeah, and eat it. Nothing's making sense. No, it does not. Somebody's lying. I'm going to have to say it's that bitch, Cindy. <laughs> but they also found out that Jeff was lying, too, during this interview. Because this whole throws a whole kink in his whole alibi. A kink, not a kinky situation, because that's what Jeff is. He's kinky. But it throws a kink in his alibi. He was saying he was 50 miles away, but Cindy's like... Hey, I gave him fifteen dollars for gas when he called me up. Yeah, we met at the gas station. Yeah, it's like, yeah, here, let me throw you under the freaking bus, there, Jeff. Yeah, slam. Oh, guess well, we I gotta mean, go talk to Jeff again, and find out how. Maybe we they didn't tell away. each other their alibis, and she didn't know that he was telling them fifty miles what away. What do you mean alibis? Their alibis of where they were. Yes, dude, their alibis of where they were at the time of the murder. That's what I'm talking about. So. Police, they obtain a search warrant for Cindy's office based on what they are hearing from her and Jeff and everything because now they have probable, probable cause to look at her as the murderer. Upon searching the office at work, they found something odd. Now on her desk, she had a framed photo of her and Michael, which was to be expected. It's sitting there, you know, husband and wife, right where there she can look at it all day and ponder over all their great times together, all the Milo's burgers they ate. Mm-hmm. But what was out of the ordinary was they also found a framed picture of her and Jeff. Now, this puts her affair completely on display for everyone who walks into her office. She don't even give two shits anymore, Stuart. She got her husband up there with her. And then right below it, she's got her lover down there. And she's like, yeah, ask me about it, bitch. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know? Now, another strange thing that they found in the office was a file titled Jeff Brown. Now, in this file, they found evidence that Cindy was possibly supporting Jeff financially, but at the least, she had her financials very much intertwined with his. She had a savings account with both his and her name on it. She also had her name on the title to his vehicle, and she was also on a lease to an apartment that Jeff was living in. Now, she claimed she wasn't paying for any of this stuff. She didn't make no payments, but police weren't 100% convinced on that, so it seemed like Jeff might have been a kept man. Now, like we said, she claimed that she didn't actually make any payments on these things, but she did verify that she did let him use her credit cards. Now, so Jeff's got himself quite the the game he's running. He's sleeping with this married woman, and she's giving him money of some sort. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know what he's throwing around, but uh, and in the back got, of that pest control vehicle. And he's got other women supposedly lined yeah, up. Yeah, he's got his wife he's impregnated. I mean, it's a lot. So, this didn't look like a woman that was in a casual affair or had plans to work it out with her husband. I mean, you're not signing leases and starting savings accounts if you're planning on leaving your husband. This looked like a woman who was actually ready to start a new life with a new man. They also discovered that there was a $50,000 life insurance policy on Michael, which didn't seem enough to be a motive for this. Like, money didn't seem to be a motive unless it was for Jeff. But it would have definitely been an added benefit for them to start their life together. Yeah, if you're going to kill somebody for $50,000 and think that you're going to be rich, then you're a complete idiot. Yeah, that's not going to that's not going to cut it. But like I said, they don't think that she was an accountant and stuff like that. It didn't seem like she I mean, they make good money. Yeah. So, uh, 50,000 really wasn't the motive for her personally, they don't believe, but it just 
was icing on the cake that they well, did added that. perk. Yeah. So at this point, police received the phone records and they were kind of eye popping, kind of eye opening for the detectives, police department. Also made them want to burn their eyes, but we'll get into that. Yeah. <laughs> made one one fellow in particular just want to take a solder and iron, jam it in each eyeball, and be done with it. Yeah. <laughs> Cindy and Jeff had been calling all day of the murder. They were texting. Yeah, I think they said there was a total of, I think, 11 calls coming from one way, like either to, from Cindy to Jeff, and then eight going back the other way. So 19 to 20 calls just in that day alone. I mean, that's yeah. a lot. And they were texting each other. I mean, we have two children, and I don't call or text through that much during the day. No. That's that's a lot of communication. Yeah, the phone calls alone are more than we call or pretty much text in one day to each other. Yeah. So, on top of the phone calls, there's texting. And as police would also find out, there was sexting. Sexting. And we don't mean just sexy texts. We mean photos. Nudes. Nudes. The detectives and prosecutors working the case had the honor of looking through hundreds and hundreds of sex, as well as nude photos of not just one, but both of them. Yeah. The phone records, along with Cindy's statement, pointed to Jeff's alibi being a lie. The phone records revealed that he had sent a text at 657 saying, keep me posted, quote, this would have been right at the end of the church service because the church service ran from 6 to 7 p.m. So they're about to leave. So to police, this sounded like Jeff was asking for details. Drink. Of the murder happening while it was happening. Like he wanted to be in on the... He needed to be in it. You yeah, know? he wanted to hear it. And like, yeah. He didn't want them that information about their sex life, but he wanted to know when this guy was about to get... Whacked. Killed. Yeah. Yep. So, the phone records also show that Jeff was on the phone with Cindy right up to the minute that she called 911. The phone call lasted about 30 minutes. Police believe that she called secretly, that right about the time church was ending. Yeah, she's doing the little side dial on her phone. She's putting, like, call Jeff, and then she's putting it away to the side. And the whole time they're driving and everything, getting getting the food, doing all the stuff, Jeff is secretly listening in. Yep. So they do everything on the way home and they believe that he actually did listen in on the murder because they finally have the damning evidence against Cindy and Jeff. And this is the 911 call. When Cindy called, the system begins recording as soon as the phone starts ringing to 911. Yeah, the minute you're I not doesn't matter. Ma- yeah. I didn't know that till this case. Yeah. Anyways, the minute you uh I don't think a lot of people knew that. The minute you um, call, apparently, it starts recording right then. It's not when the operator picks up. Yeah. So, it can it can hear everything happening in your house from the time that, that the connection is made. Yep. Even though you're hearing ringing. Big brother, Stuart. That's I know. Brother Even though right you're there. thinking that they're ringing and they ain't picked up yet. Oh, my God. No one can hear me. I can talk about how I killed this guy. Yeah. And no yeah. one's going to hear me. And then as soon as the 911 operator, I'll get on there and act all sad. Yeah. Not saying Cindy did this, but continue on. We would not say Cindy did it without evidence. <laughs> so you can hear in the background on the recording, Cindy talking to Jeff, telling him her phone was about to die. Yeah, she just had that big ass long conversation or had him on the phone the whole entire time running that battery down. Yeah. So she's very calm. She's talking to him. She's like, Oh my God, here we are. My phone's about to die. I gotta my go. My phone's about to die. Nine one one. Ring ring. Oh my seconds god. later. Oh my God. My husband. I, I can't, can't find him. him. Yeah. Oh it's my a completely god. different person at that point. At this point, please know that they have their killers. It's Jeff and Cindy They had most likely planned to get rid of Michael and to be together. The issue is that they have no idea which one actually pulled the trigger. They just know that they planned his his death. Like, they're they're in it. They're in cahoots, Stu, if you will. Cahoots. Not cahoots. Yeah. Collusion. They do know from those phone records that Jeff's phone was pinging from just a couple hundred feet from the Reese's residence. This this means they can't pin him, like, directly in it in the house from these, but they know he's within a hundred, couple hundred feet of the house. So this could p- potentially put him inside the residence or just within a few hundred feet, a few feet of the residence. They don't know. 
After all this information, detectives did have enough to arrest the couple on March 11th, 2015. They caught them together after they had lunch. So these two yahoos are continuing their affair, basically. In, in Just, broad daylight. Don't even... Don't give two... Zero fucks given with zero. these two. <laughs> put, it on a, put it on a pillow, stitch it in, because they don't care. Yeah, because they're not even trying to hide the fact that they're hanging out, doing their thing. And obviously plan on continuing. Her husband just died, and she's con- she's dating this guy or whatever, or just continuing on this whole relationship. It's really messed up. Yeah. So police- She's a terrible person. Is she? Both of them are. Yeah, they're, they're both. They're terrible people. Just god-awful. So police were able to charge both of them with murder since in Alabama it didn't matter who pulled the trigger because they could both be charged equally, even if one was just helping to plan the murder. Basically, what they're saying is that since there was so much involvement from Jeff into the planning and finding out what was going on with the phone call, 30 minutes and everything. Yeah, they were obviously planning this together. And so in Alabama, that means you were just as equally liable whether you pulled the trigger or not. Collusion. Yes. Just like in the old... uh... What? That show we used to watch? Yeah. What was oh, that show? Uh, the, what league. Was the, the League. The League, yeah. Oh, my yeah. God, we love that, that show. That was, a good, that was a good show. So, both were released on bail awaiting trial. Many in the community were waiting for one of them to flip on the other. But with the trial approaching and Jeff going first in August of 2016... It didn't that, seem like either one was going to. They were. No. Everyone was getting ready for a very... Juicy yeah. trial with all this all the love gossip affair going on. and oh, yeah. sexting and nudes. Everybody's just getting there. All the ladies in town just getting ready. The church ladies like, oh, we got some gossip. We'll mm-hmm. pray for them. Mm-hmm. Let's pray for them. Bless Who's their hearts. Who's gonna flip on who? <laughs> yep. But to the surprise of many, pretty much everyone, Jeff told his lawyer that morning that he wanted to make a plea deal. So they spoke to prosecutors, and Jeff pleaded down. Mm-hmm. That's how that works. <laughs> Pleaded down to old manslaughter. Yes, he did. He decided that he was going to testify against Cindy. And with this plea deal, Jeff was sentenced to 20 years in prison on December 16th, 2016. Now, later that month, Cindy went on trial with Jeff as their star witness for the state. He walked the jury through that entire day and into the murder, stating that him and Cindy had gone to lunch that day and he had dropped her back off work before her husband picked her up. So Michael's dropping her off at work. He's going to work. Oh, her lover, Jeff, is picking her up for lunch. They're going to have a little lunch date, talk about his divorce, everything that he needs to get done. He drops her back off and then her husband's picking her back up. And I'm sure people at work are watching this happen. I mean, this isn't like... Uh, This is probably out in the open. Like, everyone's aware that this bitch is doing this to Michael. Now, she he stated that Cindy shot Michael, and he actually heard the gunshot go off on the phone because he's listening in the background. She then met him at the gas station where she gave him the gun and some jewelry to get rid of, uh, and this was to make it, one, to get rid of the, the murder weapon, and two, the jewelry was to make it look like someone had broken and, you know, was in the midst of a burglary whenever they walked, Michael was there or something like that, or they came in to burglarize it while she was gone at the Piggly Wiggly. Michael was there and he got shot. He also told the jury that Cindy had wanted him to hire hitmen to actually kill her husband. And that's why just the month before the murder, he was asking those guys at work. This was all on Cindy's behalf is what he is claiming is going on in this situation, Stu. I'm sure she's running the whole show. I don't know. He's he's a willer and a dealer, Stu. I don't know. He's he's a willer and dealer, but I mean, she's for some reason I don't know what what uh, the voodoo punani that Cindy has Ew. over old Michael. Oh God! Or I mean, over old Jeff. But he's willing. What does to... Jeff have? He's sleeping with all these women. I don't know. Magic just, giggle stick. Just I don't as know. just <laughs> just as a side note, too, uh, we wanted to just talk about the whole Cindy's first husband having commit suicide they actually because she was so suspicious with this whole thing and they and they knew she killed michael or was part of killing michael they actually reopened that case but they were unable to find anything that i'm not sure what all the information was surrounding that what sui- suicide information mean, I mean details <laughs> yes drink. anyways that information surrounding that 
suicide, but apparently it was, they wanted to reopen it just to make sure, but they couldn't find anything that stuck out to them to make it look like she did anything. But who knows, Stuart? We don't know. We, we don't, don't know. We don't have any information on that one. So anyway, so all this, her, Cindy's defense attorney argues that Cindy could not have actually pulled the trigger as the trajectory of the bullet would have been from someone standing taller than Michael. So the trajectory was pointed down and Cindy's about three inches shorter than Michael. Jeff, however, was taller than Michael. So they're arguing that Cindy didn't actually pull the trigger, but they're, they're still not arguing that she didn't have anything to do with this. Like, we're, they were just giving that up like, hey, she... <laughs> She, she she may have, but she, she didn't may, actually. She may have, but she didn't actually pull the trigger. Jeff is the really the one that's the monster in this whole situation. Yeah, well, maybe they're both monsters. Well, they didn't I have a step stool. Terrible. They didn't have a step stool in the house. That well, that Cindy mean, how would she? On. How would she stand up and shoot him, and him not in the back of the head, and him not be there, not know that this was happening? Well, they had a remodel going on in the back of the house. Well, what police think happened was that. Whenever they walked into the home, Cindy, they put their food down. They had a dog, and the police think that Cindy was behind Michael, had the gun. He walks down the hallway, and he's going out the back of the the new construction area to let the dog out to go to the bathroom, and that's when she decided to shoot him. But again, the trajectory of the bullet, it's there is some questions. But well, either he could have squatted down to pet the dog, and boom. This is there true. Wow, Stu, you really just open things. I up. just cracked this case wide open. <laughs> he did. Anyway, so it takes the jury only 90 minutes to come back with a guilty verdict, surprisingly. And the sentencing would happen that next year in January, uh, on January 11th, 2017. And at that point, she was sentenced to 40 years with the possibility of parole. Cindy immediately appealed her conviction. Surprise, surprise. She claimed that there was not enough evidence that she killed her husband and that the jury should have been given the option of manslaughter. Why what, should they have been given the option of manslaughter? Because it's like she was didn't actually do it, but she was a part of it. And just a lesser sentencing is what she would have got. That's so what, she's similar. not saying, I'm not not guilty. Okay, maybe I might have something to do with it, but... But maybe... Yeah. Something less. Because, you know, like we said, Jeff, he pled down to manslaughter, and he only got 20 years mm-hmm. with the possibility of parole. Yeah, so... She's she's like, hey, that shorter sentence could have came in handy. I had the jury found me guilty less guilty, yeah, less yeah. guilty than still than guilty, they found but me. guilty of manslaughter instead. So on August 11, twenty seventeen, the court found that her claims were not sufficient. Cindy is cur- currently serving out her forty year sentence at Julia Julia Tutwiler Prison for Women in. Okay, here we go. Wom. What I forgot a Wumka. T in there. It's what it's I forgot a T in there. It's what Tumka, I think. Oh. Alab- maybe. I don't know about this the pronunciation, but there is a T missing in that Stu. It's what Tumka. Okay. Well the T would actually come in handy. <laughs> T always comes in handy. Yeah, I got a W E U M P K A. Wumpka. 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 Oh, there it is. <laughs> Alabama. So she will be eligible for parole in twenty thirty. So fellas, mark your calendars. Because for, for some reason she has some voodoo down south. Oh, my God. Stuart. Cindy, for some reason, was labeled in the prison system as being a minimum out inmate. Yeah, that's what it's called, a minimum out inmate. Which means she was not a threat and could do work outside the prison without supervision. She this, was, was just, this wasn't even three years after she was convicted that she got this minimum out classification in the system. Yeah, we're talking first degree murder. Yeah, and this minimum out classification basically allowed her to do work outside of the prison without any supervision. And this this program was ran at the Birmingham Work Release uh, Center in in Birmingham, obviously. <laughs> Anyways, but basically it was going to allow her to go do work without any correctional officers monitoring her. However, the family of Michael took issue with this because this was going to be in the area where they live. Like that Morris, Alabama is only... 20 miles outside of Birmingham. So she might have been doing work release in that area. So they were like, this ain't happening. They they brought it to the news's attention. They talked to the prison system, everything. And apparently, I don't know if it was like a mistake or they were just like, okay, we'll just pretend like we didn't mean to do that. But she never actually went to that program. They said it was just temporary and she was sent back to the Tutwiler facility. And that's currently where she's at. 
waiting for Pearl. Sitting in gin pop. Yep, gin pop. Yep. Jeff is currently serving out his sentence in Stayin. <laughs> Staten. Staten. I forgot the T again. Oh. I don't know what's wrong with it's Dayton Correctional Center in Watumpica, Alabama. So they're in the same town. The lovebirds are in the same town. Well, there's a T in Watumpica now. I know that. I got it right the second. I didn't think the T on your typewriter was working for some reason. So, <laughs> Jeff. The dumbass in your talking certainly is, though. Wow. <laughs> Jeff is eligible for parole in 2023. So, coming up, ladies, he's free. I mm-hmm. heard he's uh, good in bed. Apparently, and in back of a pest control truck. I'm guessing he's got him one of them, uh, um, what you call it? Prison the, wives? No, no. Who's the oh. guy that was dating Kim Kar- Kardashian? Uh, I don't know. The, the comedian. Pete? The, the, the Davis guy, yeah. I'm yeah. guessing he's got one of them Davis uh, down down south things going on. Okay, I don't even That's know what that means. That's why all the ladies love I don't follow him. the Kardashians as much as you do, apparently. I'm not keeping up with the Kardashians like you. You're not keeping up with them anymore? No, I don't. I never kept up with the Kardashians. You're a liar. You're a damn okay, liar. Okay, I might have bought in one season, but after that, I'm strictly Real Housewives and Vanderpump Rules. Well, supposedly Pete and Davidson. And Southern Charm. Pete Davidson has some... some, some okay, I don't want to talk about Pete... I don't want to talk about Pete Davidson's situation down south. I, I don't want to talk about it either. That's but just why what you pe- brought it up. That's because people are telling me that in headlines. That, oh, my God. Okay, anyway, so... So, so maybe Jeff's Jeff, got a little of that going maybe on, Maybe he too. does. Maybe he'll get a Kardashian after this. So Jeff's oh, eligible yeah. for parole in 2023, and the Reese's home where Michael was murdered, from last I could tell, it had been torn down because it said it's a vacant lot right now. So it's owned, but it's vacant land. Someone bought it. but So, yeah, someone just apparently ripped down the whole house. Well, why wouldn't you? Yeah, it's... It's a little, and it was under mid-construction. I mean, construction. You're, yeah, you're in the middle of a remodel with additions and all kinds and of And someone crap. was murdered in there. And somebody was murdered Probably in the got remodel. a great deal, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine. Yeah. Probably all right, cover, so that's our, uh, um, I'm going to stop Stu now. <laughs> cover court cost. Yeah, so that's our episode for tonight, Alabama. Poor Michael, he was just trying to get married again, have a normal relationship. And he got married to this black widow bitch that's going to take him out for I don't even know what reason. Sounds like she could have just left him and be done. So I don't really know. They said that maybe she was going to be, didn't want it look bad that she was getting divorced because she was such a religious person. But murdering her husband, that doesn't make sense to me. No, I don't. (laughs) Because divorce isn't in one of the like Ten Commandments, but murdering is. Thou shalt murder, I think, was number one. Thou shalt not kill. So (laughs) I feel like that's a little bit worse on the whole religious thing. All right, so Stu, do you have a y'all need Jesus for us tonight? Well, don't I always? Oh, God. Let's see what this one is. All right. Are you ready for this headline? I am. You going to give me a Florida, not Florida? After I hear the headline. All right. Stalking suspect calls the police to complain about his victim's dad. Florida. A man in, I want to say, because we're from Louisiana, Lenoir, but it could be Lenoir, Len- Tennessee. How is it spelled? L e n o i r. Lenoir. Lenoir. Lenoir, Tennessee. Stewart. I'm. Lenoir City, Tennessee. You might be. You might have grown up in Louisiana, but I grew up in Texas. That's Lenoir, Tennessee. You think that's Lenoir? <laughs> yes. Okay. It's Tennessee, not Florida. Okay. Called police. The man called the police to complain about a threat from the father of a girl he had been stalking, allegedly. The video, which he posted to his YouTube channel, made the rounds on Twitter for a day or two before the guy was finally arrested. The Daily Beast reporting in the video, we hear a 25-year-old Jacob Yerkes tell two police officers about what's been going on and what led him to call them out. He explains that he showed up to the Cracker Barrel looking to play a song oh, for a the girl. Cracker Barrel. Yeah. He wanted to play a mixtape for a Pretty a much. mixtape? Well, I mean, oh. from the 80s, 90s, up to mid-90s, you know what a mixtape is. But he wants to play this song for a girl he used to work with and that she drove off. He says he chased her for a couple of blocks because he really wanted her to hear this song. And he felt that she kind of wanted him chasing her. Oh, God. Yerkes 
went on to say that her father called him and threatened his life, and he just thinks that they should have his name on file. He then explains that women like to be chased, and that most of them have rape fantasies. Oh my God, Stuart, this went dark for y'all need Mm. Jesus all of a sudden. Well, somebody needs a little Jesus. Okay, well, this person needs to be locked up. He also referenced BDSM porn to explain (laughs) his thought process. Okay, all right, let's... He continues to argue with police at one point stating that he is a man and has needs himself. All right, so he's going to be on another a future episode, I'm sure, for something that he's done. He's got needs to be locked up immediately. There's immediately, if not him. sooner. Yeah. So the conversation doesn't go well, but guess what? Officers let him go in the moment. I'm sure they did. Discussion of the videos on social media led the FBI investigation oh, and God. eventually his arrest for making unsolicited contact with a coworker. He is now facing charges of stalking and harassment, and local police say that more charges are possible. Well, thank God, because he doesn't need to be out and about. He does not, because it doesn't sound like even after the police are like, dude. You should not be doing this. He's like, no, no, no. You don't understand, police officers. They really like this. They have rape fantasies. I saw it on a video somewhere, (laughs) some porn video somewhere. They're they're telling me that they have rape fantasies. Anyways, all right. Well, so if you if you see Mister Yerkes out there, run, run, Jacob Yerkes. He will chase you because he thinks that's what you want. Yeah, because you got to hear this song on a mixtape that I'm in. Yeah. All right, so Stu, thank you for the y'all need Jesus. I guess that was a that one took a turn, Stu, a turn. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Always a surprise there with the y'all need Jesus. But um, all right, so that's our episode for tonight. And so you know, like us on the Instagrams, follow us on the Facebooks, or opposites, whatever, whichever lingo is for each one of those social well, medias. You know, as as us youngsters say, there, care it's the gram. The gram, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had to explain. We wrote something a couple, like a little while back about, and I said, you do it for the gram. And he was like, I don't understand that. I'm like, how do you not heard that? Do it for the gram. Like you, you do stuff that that's maybe uncomfortable or doesn't make sense or something so you can get a good picture. You dress up in sweaters and flannels and boots in 90 degree weather and take a picture even though you're sweating so you can look cute on Instagram. But anyways. Karen's full of crap. I, I had to explain to her what Instagram was about. Snapchat, oh, shut up. The whole, the whole nine. You're an idiot. Anyways. All right. So I guess we will see you next time. Bye, everyone. Say bye, Stu. Bye, Stu. Don't you know it's bad luck to be superstitious but never